This patient's lungs were so bad, gas exchange had to happen outside of her body. Learning to read ABGs and understanding what to do with that information is a very important skill for any nurse. I'm excited to walk you through it, but first, head over to nursing.com slash lab values for a free copy of one of our best cheat sheets, the 63 must know lab values. Hi, I'm Nurse Abby, and I loved working in the cardiovascular ICU. That was truly one of my favorite nursing jobs. Today, I want to share with you the story of one of my more complicated patients. For several months, I took care of a complex COVID patient. We'll call her Esther. Because Esther's COVID infection was so bad, her lungs were in incredibly terrible shape that she had to endure a highly specialized type of lung support called ECMO. Esther came to my hospital from a rural area out of state. When she came to us, all the functions of her lungs were being handled by machines. Her lungs were in such bad shape that a ventilator had to actually handle ventilation by moving air through her airways. And an ECMO machine was used to pull blood from her body to perform gas exchange. All of that normally takes place in the lungs. You know, when carbon dioxide and oxygen are exchanged in the alveoli, after the blood flows through the ECMO machine, it becomes oxygenated as CO2 is removed. Then that blood is returned to the patient's body. So what did this mean for me as my patient's nurse? I'm going to really focus on the special things I needed to be aware of for the ECMO machine, even though there were a lot of other things going on with the patient. So for a patient on ECMO, these are some key areas of focus. One, we must monitor ABGs. For a patient on ECMO, we needed to take ABGs or arterial blood gases at least every four hours. And we needed to watch those really closely to spot for any abnormalities and then use it to make adjustments. The second thing that you have to do is to adjust the sweep. This is why we really needed those ABG values. The ECMO machine is connected to oxygen. The term sweep refers to the oxygen coming from the wall that connects to the oxygenator in the ECMO machine. We make adjustments to the sweep based on the arterial blood gas values. Three, monitoring everything connected to my patient. The ECMO cannula is pretty large and must stay exactly in place where the surgeon placed it and sutured it. Since it's located in a large vessel and hemorrhage can happen fast if it becomes dislodged. This makes turning or transporting very tricky for an ECMO patient and requires a close eye on all the tubes and all the lines, anything attached to the patient. Okay, now you know what I was looking out for. Now let me tell you what happened to Esther. One shift, I had an aide and another RN with me giving Esther a bed bath. We had turned her to one side to wash her back side and finish replacing the sheets. We got her back onto her back and repositioned her carefully. Suddenly, we noticed that Esther was getting really agitated. We used a tiny bolus of propofol, but that didn't help to calm her down, so something else had to be wrong. I checked her vitals on the monitor, and her SpO2 was dropping rapidly, but the ventilator settings hadn't changed, and nothing was wrong with the position of her endotracheal tube. It was then that I noticed something unusual. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something. The tube going from the ECMO machine back to my patient, the blood was changing color. The beautiful bright red it should be was missing. And instead, the blood was turning a deep, dark, almost purple red, the color of deoxygenated blood. That was not good. Deoxygenated blood should not have been going back to my patient after the ECMO machine. After some panic from all of us, the RN helping me had the brilliant idea to check the sweep. And indeed, sometimes through all the turning, repositioning, and changing of the bed sheets, the sweep had come unplugged from the wall. The ECMO machine was no longer getting oxygen or pressure from the oxygen, so the ECMO machine was no longer able to remove carbon dioxide from the blood. Therefore, 
deoxygenated blood was returning to my patient. Can you guess what this patient's ABG values would have looked like after an event like this? Do you think that they would have been acidotic or alkalotic? Let's interpret an ABG together to practice and see if it helps you determine which acid-base imbalance my patient experienced. Here's the question. The nurse is interpreting the following ABG results, pH of 7.23, PaCO2 of 52, bicarb of 23. Which of the following acid-base imbalances is occurring? Respiratory alkalosis, respiratory acidosis, metabolic acidosis, or metabolic alkalosis. Did you say respiratory acidosis? You're right. We know it's acidosis because the pH is less than 7.35 at 7.23. We also know that it's respiratory acidosis because it's the PaCO2 that's out of whack, whereas the bicarb or the HCO3 is within normal range between 22 to 26 milliequivalents per liter at 23. So just as the question noted, the nurse can interpret that the patient is experiencing respiratory acidosis due to the low pH and a high PaCO2. As mentioned before, ABGs are taken at least every four hours on a shift, so there are multiple opportunities to assess for acid-base imbalance. However, in the CVICU, especially when a patient is on ECMO, they're often taken even more frequently. ABGs are taken to analyze the effectiveness of the sweep and to gauge if the lungs are healing. So let's talk about ABGs for a minute. What are we looking for and especially why? Where I worked, the ABGs are processed by respiratory therapy and results appear in the EHR for the nurse to interpret. From there, the nurse must pay attention to the critical pieces of the report. First, the pH which should be between 7.35 and 7.45. Next, the PaCO2, which is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and should be between 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury and accounts for acidity. Also bicarb or HCO3, whose normal value should be between 22 and 26 milliequivalents per liter. And that's the base or the alkaline piece, which is regulated by the kidneys. And the PaO2, which should be between 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury and is the partial pressure of oxygen. How well do you know your ABGs? Can you guess what my patient's ABGs would have looked like? I put a link in the description below for a quick practice quiz you can take on Ontario blood classes to see what your current level of understanding is. Go ahead, I'll wait. Now back to the story. Well, maybe you guessed it. Esther had become acidotic. Did you get it right? Since the sweep had become unplugged and her lungs were so bad, gas exchange wasn't happening, so my patient was growing acidotic. No gas exchange means O2 and CO2 are not being exchanged. CO2 isn't being removed and O2 is not added. When CO2 builds up in the blood, uh-oh, that's acidosis, but why is it acidic? Well, CO2 is an acid in water. In the blood, it will react with water and create hydrogen ions. pH is literally a measure of a concentration of hydrogen ions. However, just as a reminder, it is an inverse relationship. More hydrogen ions lower the pH. So our PaCO2, our acid, had increased, then we would see our pH decreasing, becoming more acidotic. Because this was respiratory related, it was respiratory acidosis. The body is all about homeostasis, so it will try to compensate for acidosis by having the kidneys retain bicarb and produce more bicarb, or HCO3. Bicarb is a base, or it's alkaline, so it will bind with the free hydrogen ions and raise the blood pH. However, it takes far too long in a scenario like this for that to actually be effective or corrective. So how does this story end? What did I need to do with the ABGs throughout the rest of the shift? Well, as you can imagine, we quickly got the sweep 
attached back to the oxygen on the wall and watched as the blood turned bright red again as it flowed through the oxygenator. With gas exchange once again taking place, the patient started to calm down. Because remember, restlessness is actually a hallmark sign of respiratory acidosis. With such a significant hypoxic event, I almost had to start over with titration of the sweep. I took the first ABG after plugging the sweep back in to determine a baseline. I wondered if it would need to be adjusted from the number of liters that had been flowing before it was disconnected. I actually recall that I had to turn the sweep up because the CO2 was high and the pH was really low. The patient initially needed additional CO2 flowing through the oxygenator to get that excess CO2 removed from the blood. Other values like the PaO2 hadn't budged much despite the event, and I recall this value staying near 80 millimeters per mercury. Another thing that I needed to really watch out for with Esther was low oxygen levels at the cellular level. When this occurs, anaerobic metabolism may start taking place in the body. Because if cells aren't getting enough oxygen, they go through an alternate metabolic pathway and lactic acid is the byproduct. It's something that we also had to watch closely and even trend because our patients were often on pressors and we needed to balance that with IV resuscitation to optimize the organ perfusion and blood pressure. Subsequent ABGs allowed me to titrate the sweep back down to where it was when I started the shift. And thankfully, her lactate didn't budge from the normal level it had been, despite the lack of oxygenated blood flowing back to her body through the ECMO machine during the hypoxic event. Bicarbonate, or HCO3, is indicative of kidney function. Sometimes patients will even need supplementation and bicarb will be administered by a push dose through their IV to help regulate acidosis. The ABGs help the nurse and the provider determine when that's necessary and how many ampules are needed to replace bicarb to restore normal levels in the blood. Thankfully, we didn't need to intervene by administering bicarb to my patient, and titrating the sweep was enough to correct the acidosis. I stressed about my understanding, passing my classes, and ultimately passing the NCLEX. I found success when I started using nursing.com because it helped me find the must-know information with clear and concise lesson videos, and then I would check my knowledge with the lesson quizzes. I used Simplex to not only evaluate if I was ready for the NCLEX, but it would also give me personalized suggestions on what I should study to fill in my knowledge gaps. I could focus on those topics further with custom quizzes and use the additional study tools that are adapted to my personal learning style. Although you may never treat a patient on ECMO, I hope you learned the importance and implementation of ABGs in care of patients and how learning and understanding interpretation of ABGs will help you in your role as the nurse. If you need some more resources and help, you can find more at nursing.com slash lab values. I hope this has helped you understand ABGs a bit better. We are rooting for you. So go out and be your best self today, and as always, happy nursing.